Hi everybody, welcome to today's webinar. My name is McKay Allen. I'm the content manager and mountain marketing manager at Log My Calls, and we're really excited to be here today. Uh, it is a beautiful Wednesday afternoon. Uh, Derek is in Boston. I'm in Utah, so we're on other ends of the country, and I'm sure you're joining us from all over the place as well. So we're really excited everybody's here. Uh, a few announcements, and then we'll get started. Number one, if you have questions during today's presentation, we hope you do, just type those into the question bar, and I'll read those questions verbally to Derek at the conclusion of his presentation, and he can address as many of those as, as he possibly can. Um, so again, we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, typically, the, the best information is honestly disseminated during the question and answer portion, so please ask questions. That's first and foremost. Second, I want to give you a little bit of background about this webinar series and about Log My Calls if you're not uh, familiar with us. We host this webinar series uh, once a week. Uh, typically, uh, sometimes we have two webinars a week if it's a particularly busy week and we have a few things on the calendar. Um, logmycalls.com slash webinar. Uh, you can actually go to that webinar library and see our upcoming webinars, but also recorded webinars. Um, that we've had in the last uh, six to eight months. There's about 80 webinars on that uh, in that library. So that's a, that's a good resource, and it's, it's totally without form fill out. You just go in and you can listen to webinars all day long and become marketing geniuses. So that's first and foremost. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, too, just to give you some background on who we are, uh, Log My Calls is a call tracking and call analytics solution. So uh, agencies and businesses use us to determine which ads, campaigns, keywords, etc., produce phone calls and which don't. Um, our tool can also track what happens during the call. It's the only tool in the market that does that. So it can tell you what percentage of your calls close, whether your uh, callers mentioned a competitor, whether you're, they're good leads or bad leads, whether the person answering the phone did a good job or bad job. We work with small businesses, very large businesses, and agencies, so all over the map. And we encourage you to use this if you're using any, doing any sort of online marketing at all. Uh, phone calls close the loop. So logmycalls.com to get more information. Finally, before we turn it over to Derek, this webinar is being recorded. So if you do want to listen to it again in the future, you can. Or share it with people on social media. We encourage you to do that. Uh, and you can even uh, embed it on your site if you want, which would be cool too. Uh, so finally, with that, I do want to introduce uh, Derek Edmund with Co-Marketing Associates. Um, they're located in Boston. Derek can tell you a little bit more about the firm. I did want to introduce him, though. He is the managing partner and also the director of SEO and social media strategies. And he is a profoundly accomplished writer in the, in the world of SEO and the world of uh, search engine marketing. Um, he's written in and been mentioned in places like Search Engine Land, Mashable, um, in B2B Magazine, and Inc. Magazine. So all over the place. He writes regularly, I believe he said, for Search Engine Land and Search Engine Watch. Uh, he's a true expert in the space, uh, and uh, he, he uh, as I said, the firm is in Boston, downtown Boston, right in the city, um, and he uh, is an expert in all things SEO. He's spoken at conferences across the country uh, and uh, um, is, a, is a true expert in the space. So we're excited that uh, Derek's agreed to join us today. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, sir, and uh, thanks again. Thank you, McKay Allen. I really appreciate it, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to to speak in front of our, to present in front of everyone. And thanks for your time as well. Um, definitely can't um, underscore the importance of questions at the end. Uh, hope you get some good ones. It will certainly add value and, and hopefully um, and some more uh, ideas to what I'll be presenting here. Uncovering content market marketing opportunities right in front of you. So, uh, as indicated, my name is Derek Edmond, managing partner here, Co-Marketing Associates. Uh, we are a B2B search engine marketing agency. We work uh, with SEO, PPC, and social media, primarily in the B2B markets. Uh, we're based out of Boston, um, and we got into content marketing because our belief uh, here is that content is the foundation for pretty much everything we're doing uh, as we execute campaigns for clients. It provides a foundation for keyword strategy. Um, you need a place to, to actually put those keywords. Um, it allows you to acquire links. It allows you to gain social media visibility. And from the, the broader business side, most importantly, it, uh, it provides an opportunity for, for lead generation tactics. 
So with that in mind, the goal uh, for what we're here for and what I hope everyone participating and listening in gets is some real actionable ideas uh, for executing content marketing initiatives as early as today. Um, hopefully it spurs some ideas and creativity, but also some places maybe you've overlooked um, or maybe um, you can start working on um, right now. But a little background on content marketing first. So about a year ago, Demandbase uh, put, it, put out, and Zip Davis put out a report indicating the tactics that B2B marketers are using for lead generation. And as you can see, SEO, social media, uh, inbound or content marketing, uh, as they were grouping it all together, search engine advertising all played a part in some of the top tactics, SEO and social media at the top. Um, so for us, with that, what I felt there when I, we saw this report and started looking at it is it was basically validating uh, our decisions to, to base what we do uh, around content. And for the most part, Google seemed to agree. So in, in our space, in the search space, what we've seen over the last 12, you know, one or two years is um, a series of updates. Uh, and they're meant to essentially um, you know, it's Google in particular's way of um, trying to remove the spam and clutter that's out there and search engine results and the people we're seeing. Quality, and I believe a better understanding of marketing in particular, seem to have come into much greater focus. And there's been huge penalties for marketers and site owners who are trying to do things meant to either trick or take advantage of algorith algorithmic weaknesses. Um, and these penalties are being felt by site owners from everywhere. Uh, we've seen some traffic reports where you can see the huge drop um, in, a, in a week turnaround. Um, ultimately, leads to more natural link building and better content. And in the broader content marketing world, marketing profs in coordination with the CART Content Marketing Institute put out a survey uh, to B2B marketers uh, talking about the whole concept of content marketing. And 91%, uh, which shouldn't be surprising, I guess, indicated that they were using content as a key strategy in their initiatives uh, in 2013. Um, this is actually the second year they put out the survey. And what struck me as interesting is another facet of this report which was when they looked at the challenges that B2B content marketers were facing. Um, in, the, in the most recent update, 64% had said that producing enough content was their biggest challenge. That, uh, was, that changed um, the year before. Producing the kind of content that engages, that was the most, um, most challenging facet. And, and my hope, I guess, here is that, one, uh, people just kind of understand and, and make the general assumption that quality content uh, is really the name of the game. Um, you know, and it's just, it, it's assumed that that's part of the equation. Um, because for me, the question is, what does enough content really mean? In other words, does, would one blog post or, or one additional piece of material per month, would that, you know, is that what people are thinking is going to enable um, them to hit their marketing goals? Uh, each each month or each for the year, uh, or do they mean several hundred? Uh, I guess you know where I'm going with that is it would be great to know at least at some level what the percentages were when people think about the concept of producing enough content uh, and how much content is really going to to fulfill their marketing goals. And I put this example out here. Um, our colleagues here allowed my call. This was a fantastic, I thought, case study. Um, on content marketing and what it can do. Um, it was a huge content push, 150 blog posts in 50 days. And, and I would definitely recommend, if you haven't seen it, um, to check this out and, and look at some of the traffic metrics and overall volume metrics and lead metrics that this initiative um, uncovered. Um, but, but I do think that for many of us, many of the clients we work with, uh, it's hard to commit to, to one blog post a, a week, um, let alone a day, and, and let alone three or more on a daily basis. Unless publishing is a major component 
of your internet marketing strategy, this type of volume uh, can be certainly overwhelming. And that's the face we get when uh, our clients uh, start to realize this. Uh, the realization hits that you know there's going to be a heavy push that needs to happen, and, and we need to work with them to determine the right goals and objectives in relation to what the resources are um, that are going to be part of the overall content marketing equation for their programs. But oftentimes, you don't have to overextend yourself to be effective. As we work with companies and different organizations, we want to look at what's already there and what needs to, what can be enhanced and optimized. Um, and think about the ideas that you already have easy access to. So the rest of these slides, what I want to show is just four potential themes and points of directions uh, for content marketing ideas uh, that hopefully are, are right in front of you. So idea number one. Tell a better story in your company section. So your company section, your about section, um, whatever you might want to call that. Um, prospects want to learn more about the companies that they're going to work with, they're going to buy products from, they're going to partner with, uh, whatever that might be. Um, I wrote an article about this a few weeks ago, and, and my colleagues and I uh, at Comarketing, we really agree that the about section is becoming that much more critical to internet marketing efforts. Uh, why is that? Because it's Social media really makes the ability for customers to connect with others, and that includes other customers, business owners, marketers, whomever. Um, it makes that ability to connect much simpler and much more direct. In part, they, meaning the customer and prospect, expect to connect uh, and learn more and be able to impact more the, the company and their decisions. And the about section or the company section can be a critical centerpiece for doing this. So here are a few examples first. Uh, Thumbtack. Uh, it is a small site. Uh, and what I like about it is the way their about section allows you to scroll down to learn more about the company. Uh, it's very simple, very intuitive, um, telling you what they do, uh, what they're about. Um, and it brings you all the way down, and, and this is where conversion and, and call to action come into play. So you scroll down and learn more about the company and their history and, and what it is you're supposed to be doing. Um, at the very end, they give you cross links into the site, um, clear contact information, and the post a request call to action so that you can actually start uh, engaging and, and working right within the, the site structure. Um, and you can see some social media elements as well. Another example, um, 37 Signals. I feel like uh, 37 Signals does so many things right. Um, and they use a, a similar type of a layout and experience where you scroll down their about section to, to learn more about the company. I like the idea of a timeline to showcase events and, and key milestones within the company history. It allows you to learn more about the organization you're about to, in this case, buy and uh, buy a solution for. Um, you learn about their company leadership team. And their call to action, I think, is a lot is even more strong uh, in terms of you know, they bring you right to their key product offerings. And hopefully, um, the fact that you learned a little bit about, about that company and, and learned a little, about, little bit about their leadership team will lead you to ultimately create that conversion action to register um, for one of their solutions. And finally, uh, Moz is a pretty, um, you know, pretty common in our space, uh, in the search space. Um, and they, uh, you know, they're a leader in terms of what they do from a design and layout perspective and just an overall content initiatives perspective. And their about section is, is certainly a good example also. They showcase key company information. They provide that timeline, in this case in uh, uh, most recent uh, most recent at the top and then scrolling the way down. Um, and also provide insight and references to um, information about their team and core company values that, that make them tick. Um, it's a nice set of information that hopefully provides comfortability uh, in making those purchases uh, and uh, in getting, you know, ordering the subscription um, for their software. 
I have to talk a little bit, quickly touch a little bit on Google authorship because um, when it comes to company information, the leaders and influencers and key people um, are important. Um, and basically what authorship is, if you don't know, it is, it is um, from the end user perspective, the photos of and snapshots of people uh, in association to the articles and bylines and whatever else, blog posts that they've written um, that appear uh, in Google search results. I'm not going to talk about how to actually get into authorship. Um, there are a few references in this presentation that you can uh, use to learn how to register and try to get qualified for doing it. Um, there are much more um, that, are, that are very good to look at um, in this slide. But authorship leads us to author rank. And what's important um, to understand about author rank is this is the concept. This concept is about how Google is continuing to integrate Google Plus into its various properties. Um, and the key here is that Google is looking at ways to generate more personalized results. Um, and there's the notion, thought that the concept of authorship is going to maybe not replace, but certainly augment how users can search and find information. Um, building connections is the key. And there's what better place to centralize the creation of these connections uh, than the company's about section. So some tactics to think about and try, um, you know, as you look at and review your own uh, company section and about pages. Um, how can we integrate company stories to talk more about the company history? Um, from the visual perspective, integrating timelines or other design-related ways to essentially showcase key milestones uh, beyond just the list of press release archives. Um, team highlights, you know, what is the team doing? Uh, are they? And where, where can I connect to them from a social side? Uh, and looking into both Google Plus um, at the individual and the page level as well as Google Authors. Idea number two, give your content, um, give old content a new facelift. So I want to talk a little bit about an example uh, from one of our clients, John Deere. Uh, we work with the Ag and Turf Division of John Deere and support their dealer distribution network. Um, a few years ago, we, uh, we worked on a redesign with them. Uh, for the site machinefinder.com. And as we thought about how people might search for equipment, um, we, beyond Google, we realized that a key place they're going to go um, to find equipment and find dealers is deer.com. And I was pretty surprised to, and we were pretty surprised that um, as we looked at deer.com and looked at what they had, uh, in about 2005, here's an example of the, the dealer locator that they had, which was simply a series of drop-downs um, that started at the country level. And, excuse me, sorry, my presentation. It started at the country level and worked its way into each uh, state, city, and, the, and then ultimately dealer location. But we thought there was going to be a better way to do that um, and a better experience. Um, the way that we could put a facelift on the dealer locator. Um, and as we rebuilt Machine Finder, we used a combination of Google Maps uh, and local listings um, to hopefully provide that better experience. And not surprisingly, um, as you can see from the screenshot, um, you know, we were able to rank fairly well, um, oftentimes either right above or below John Deere's own dealer site, uh, deer.com, for dealer locator-based keyword results. Um, the key was, in this case, figuring a new way to position existing material and address customer needs. Fortunately, or, you know, Deere realized they needed to revamp this as well, and, and they're using not today a combination of, of maps and locating services, um, and it's a much better experience. Um, but, and really who wins with this is the customer. Uh, who you know, essentially is able to get that better way to find the information they want. Another example um, for a B2B site that we had worked with, um, a technology company, they wanted to generate more interest from their peers and educational resources 
that this technology startup had. Um, our tactic, our strategy was to create more content that would be available to be indexed by search engines. So they had a ton of material that was just out there in PDF format, white papers and research notes, different information. Um, we created individual landing pages um, to unlock keyword visibility uh, and optimize the content for search. Um, in addition to that, we enhanced the landing pages so that we could drive both PPC and SEO traffic and simplified the conversion process by adding a request form to each landing page. And as you can see with the results, we increased traffic 225% from the first quarter to the fourth quarter. Uh, and most importantly, from the business side, we, we cut the cost per lead down by 50% in that same time period. So those are a couple of examples, um, but there are several other similar opportunities I would recommend marketers consider. Um, you know, the key is to regularly audit what material you have and, and make determinations on where you can look fresh material. Um, think of your sales presentation. There are ways you can remove, perhaps, confidential information uh, and, and make it more of a, a concept type piece. Uh, marketing collateral, how can that be revamped? Third party bylines, are there ways to change those around? Um, and from a blog post perspective, can we revamp old blog posts that maybe were done a few years ago with either a new spin or more up to date information? And don't forget interviews with key sales members or key customer service representatives. Um, both groups present great opportunities because their ideas come directly from communication to prospect and customer. There's opportunity in traffic reports. Um, don't uh, certainly don't forget to mine data um, as you're as thinking of content ideas. Here are a few reports that I think are valuable to consistently look at um, for ideas. Um, first, keyword referral reports. Um, I'm using examples uh, taken from Google Analytics, um, but certainly this data is available in other resources such as Site Catalyst or Web Trends. Um, and what we're looking for here from the keyword side is long tail keywords. Um, the opportunities that maybe are three combinations of three, four, or five word phrases are much more specific search queries. Um, and if you can compare that to conversion rates, it, it, it can provide a fantastic resource for putting together ideas based off of those keywords um, because you know that they already convert fairly well. Um, and if you don't have goals and conversion rate tracking set up in analytics, um, look at other benchmarks that might be available such as a combination of bounce rates and, and new visits or some other metric, you know, series of metrics essentially to try to make some assumptions, some educated assumptions, on what a more quality visit really is. In Google Webmaster Tool, the inbound link report provides a solid opportunity to essentially figure out why people are linking to your site and what content is the most link-worthy. We use this to evaluate patterns in finding the higher value content marketing assets. And the third example is in coordination with the third-party referral report in Google Analytics. So it's not just the why they're linking, but it's are the people that actually link to your site also converting or performing some sort of a conversion action. If possible, you want to compare those two data points and replicate or extend content ideas that uh, fulfill both goals. Finally, consider asking your customers. So don't forget to get them into the mix as well. Uh, in the same manner that it might be less expensive to retain customers um, than getting new ones, building stronger relationships with your customers can help foster inbound marketing initiatives uh, and drive new business or repeat business back to the company. Uh, a few examples, 37 signals again. Um, their happy customer page, a uh, great example of recognizing the different people who use their software, um, and, the site actually, and the site keeps a happiness report, um, which shows a lot of transparency in terms of what people think and, and hopefully how the organization can consist, continually improve uh, their offering. And it provides a great way to display content on the site 
as well as establish trust for potential buyers and customers. Top Survey, an interesting, uh, interesting promotion they did um, to get customers talking about talking and, and building uh, visibility for them. Um, they got their customers talking by sending a handwritten note uh, and a Starbucks gift card from the CEO. Um, and you can see just one example of, of content being produced um, that linked that, that, that talked about them and, and hopefully provides links back in the, uh, in the long run. Um, and finally, an example from MailChimp, um, things they do. Um, they give away sh different swag, they use a sense of humor, and they have great customer service um, to build different content ideas, to build social media presence, um, and overall visibility. I think the key here is you, know, you can't be random. And what I mean by that is um, you have to identify customers based on social influence. Um, if you want people to interact and, and help um, provide content ideas um, and build visibility for you, um, you need to do some research in terms of what their social influence is, um, what customers are likely to share, uh, third party or, or different vendor uh, information, and ideally identify customers you already have a relationship with. Um, because those people, it's a much easier lead-in to building some sort of a content marketing strategy. Some, some places you can use to find and locate the right customers. Um, just a few examples. Follower Walk, part of the Moz tool set, allows you to analyze Twitter information uh, and you know, see who the influential people are that someone follows or that are followed um, by different individuals. Clout, I'm not super excited about clout scores as just a general metric for um, figuring out the social influence of someone, but it does provide a nice barometer if you're comparing multiple profiles. Um, Topsy, for looking for social media mentions. Uh, and Contactio is another social media tool uh, that allows you to take your own Twitter profile, or Twitter profiles you might run, and you can export data uh, on your following list and the people you follow uh, to learn more about uh, their net your network. Some tactics to try again. Uh, the hand, like, like shown before, the handwritten notes, gift cards, um, dinners and lunches, potentially. Um, trying to get press and reviews from your customers, as well as reviews and ratings. And you know, if all else fails, um, try giving them candy and, and, other, and other nice trinkets like that. So that is my presentation. Uh, I'm building content uh, marketing opportunities right in front of you. Um, I will turn it over to McKay and, and the rest of the team for, uh, for questions. And thank you. Awesome, Derek. Uh, good stuff. We appreciate it. Uh, great content ideas. I love the specificity of the ideas and, and uh, how uh, clear you were. So that's great. Um, again, we encourage you to all ask uh, questions here. And uh, uh, as, I, as we said, some of the best uh, feedback comes in the question and answer period. I want to address a couple of the things you mentioned in the presentation, Derek. First of all, um, you talked, <coughs> excuse me, you talked a little bit about uh, Google authorship and author rank. Can you talk about maybe expand a little bit more upon how critical that is now and likely will be in the future for SEO? Um, because it seems to me that Google is putting an increasing level of importance on those two things, and I mean if. If the trend continues, I think it could even get more important than it is now. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think that, um, well, first of all, just from the, the general um, brand perspective, um, having your, your leaders and your influencers, um, headshots and, and photos appear right there in search engine results is, is a powerful statement um, just from the pure brand building perspective. Um, but you know, as Google encourages um, and essentially drives more people into Google+, Plus, um, either purposefully or, you know, by the way of just simple registration for other Google services, um, you know, its ability to distinguish people of influence and tie that to the brands and organizations and domains that they're associated to um, is just going to become that much more valuable. And it's important, you know, I know in our space we always talk about being proactive and, and starting um, you know, doing something ahead of the curve, but 
in this case, it, it's pretty much essential because it's just going to become that um, much bigger component, I think, to the search algorithm and ranking relevance. Well, and the other the other element that I think no one's really talking about, and maybe they are, um, is that there are personal benefits, frankly, for having authorship as well. Like it's it helps your organization right now, but it it follows you around if you move to a different company. So if you produce really good content now, that's still your author rank remains with you um, in the future, and so it can help a potential employer immediately upon you becoming a potential employer for that person. Am I right or wrong there, Derek? I think you're, I think you're right. I mean, there's a personal value as well as the organizational value. And, and I have heard some companies, you know, they're worried about it from that former perspective. But, but you're right. I mean, it's just it's going to become part of a business professional's uh, online resume. The same way something like LinkedIn might be um, or Facebook. Or, or other, or slideshare, um, it's going to become that much more critical. Um, it shows uh, that you know that you're you're respected, or that you know what you're talking about in the particular space. And right, oh, I agree. Carry that from from ever, for you know essentially forever until the internet goes away, I guess. <laughs> Which I don't think will be anytime soon. It may be totally different than it you know is now. But um, okay, a couple other questions here that are starting to flow in. Um, what about, uh, and this is the, whenever we have a content marketing webinar, whenever I talk to anybody about content marketing, the number one question is, well, what do I write about? What do I talk about? What do I say? Um, mm -hmm. How do you address that? Because you g gave some very common sense uh, uh, tactics of, you know, just improving your, your company pages and your About Us pages and that sort of stuff. But in terms of producing blog content or video content, what do, where do people start? Do you have a sort of a a rule or two on how people start the process of what to produce. Well, I think if you're if you're struggling um, as a marketer, the fir the first places to go are talk to your sales force and talk to your customer service people. Um, find out, you know, and it can be tough. Everyone's schedules are busy, and and you know, salespeople have quotas, and customer service people have inquiries that they have to deal with, but. But try to get a sense of sort of what are the common questions being asked, either in the evaluation of the solution you're providing, uh, or in the, you know, in the um, feedback and questions in terms of how to actually use the solution that you offer. Um, that that's the first place I think, um, and then marry that with the keyword referral report to to see, you know, are there commonalities between what people are asked, what you know people are asking from the interview side. To what you're seeing in your Google Analytics or your website reporting data, whatever that might be, um, that, that's a nice place. I think you're one of the first places to go. That's great. Um, and then I want to reference to you mentioned our uh, case study, sort of experiment we did with uh, content marketing. I appreciate you mentioning that as well. Um, I hope that was okay. With the, yeah, no, that was great. Um, when, because we did that, we did it uh, another, for another 100 days after that, or another 50 days. We did another uh, 300. We did, basically, we ended up with 300 posts in 100 days. And the two things that were really interesting, and I wonder if you could react to this, is first, it was fascinating that the biggest increase was in those initial, initial uh, 50 days when we did the 150 uh, posts. That was the biggest mm -hmm. increase. But the increase continued. It actually just continued to slowly increase every week, more visitors to the blog, more visitors to the site, particularly organic traffic. Um, mm -hmm. Where is the balance between, I mean, most companies just can't produce three blogs a day. How do you balance, how do you produce enough content to move the needle, I guess is the question for an average business. We're getting that question a couple of times as well. Yeah, I mean, it's so hard to know exactly. I mean, the first thing is, is to get yourself a benchmark for where you are today. So, are you generating, you know, a thousand visits to your site right now, or ten thousand? Um, and what, when you, and then think about your conversion rate on what the what your traffic is providing today. So, you know, it's a math equation in some sense, um, but that's going to let you determine how much you need to grow your traffic base. In order to to hit your your marketing goals in terms of either leads or transactions, um, 
And you know, like I mean, the, your your post, I mean, phenomenal results. Um, but like you said, most people can't commit to something like that. Um, but through a combination of keyword research uh, and traffic benchmarking, um, that's where you start to figure out. Well, okay, I have this much content on my site now. It's producing this much volume. Um, and my hope is, my projection is that if I create this much more new material over the course of the year or quarter or six months, it should translate into this type of increase. Uh, keeping in mind, you know, I think keyword strategy um, and, and social media presence and, and build out uh, and those type of things. So, but you probably want to start small first, especially if resources are an issue. Um, you know, put a small goal out there. You know, if if you're doing you know a blog post a week right now, um, you know, commit to three blog posts every two weeks for a month and see how that impacts uh, you know the your overall traffic portfolio and, and look at it from a you know a per asset type of a type of view of possible meaning you know, how many page views how many entries did this post get um, based on what I was projecting it to get so on and so forth um, and keep building it that way um, you know a lot of times you're just not going to get approval to, to go hire someone new to, to be a full full-time content producer for you so you, it has to be proven throughout a, a you know a staggered growth period. Does that answer the, the question? Other, no, that that's great. Um, the other thing that I want to because you guys obviously content strategy is critical as you guys start working with your clients. Without letting us see too far behind the curtain, talk about how you approach when you get a new client on. What sort of evaluation process you do of their content? Do you guys produce the content for them? Do you help them produce it? What's the process there, again, without giving too much uh, of your secret sauce away? Sure. And it's not really, and I, I'll be totally transparent when I say there's, there's really limited secret sauce. It, it's more about you know, thorough auditing, understanding our, our client's business, uh, and then really rolling up the sleeves and, and doing uh, some of the work. And, and you know, we don't be like, we don't gain algorithms or look for short, uh, short-sighted goals. Um, the first part is just auditing, looking at the entire site structure, looking at what we have and what we need to work with, um, making sure that it's search-friendly uh, and as social-friendly as possible. Um, but you know, for example, one new client we have, they're doing, you know, they're they have a repository of images with no details to them. So the heavy lifting at the start is going to be working with their marketing team and their, their, maybe their engineering team to figure out what these images are and, and how we can apply some more detailed description. Because while you and I or someone in the industry might know what it is, Google doesn't know what it is. And we need to explain that using text and, and information. So it's trying to find those opportunities based on what we know are um, are going to be triggers for improving uh, organic search or social media, um, and auditing to to see where to, where to start first from that. Um, but really understanding the business. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So no secret sauce. I'm disappointed. I hope there was some sort of grand <laughs> secret that we could we could impart. Um, well, there's tactics that. I think yeah, the tactics ahead. that everyone uses, tactics everyone uses that, that turn out to be more successful and you like to keep them in your back pocket, you know, but um, but no, there's no shortcuts, sadly. <laughs> now, there have been a lot, uh, this is kind of off the beaten path, but I want to have you address it because we've actually gotten a lot of questions from our clients and we've had talked with a lot of agencies we work with, you know, that use Log My Calls for their clients and there have been a lot of uh, stuff on message boards online and blogs and things that have noticed that even though Google is cracking down, that, that, that content is critical to them, obviously. And even though they continue to crack down on the spammy stuff, there's always a few of the uh, sort of uh, edge cases, if you will, where somebody buys 50,000 links, they show up Thursday, and they're all of a sudden ranking number one for a critical keyword. In the call tracking space, there was a company that just showed up like a week ago, no content, no backlinks. I mean, we analyzed their stuff with Moz and with other tools, and we could see no um, apparent reason that suddenly they're number three ranked on page one. 
Um, yeah. Any insight into why that still happens occasionally and why, I mean, obviously Google's algorithm isn't perfect. Is it nothing more than that? I think so. I mean, we can't catch, you know, they're not going to be able to catch every instance. Um, they're looking at it from a, I don't know if a high levels way, but from a much more programmatic way to, to look at patterns and then put in place filters and in restrictions based on those patterns. So it, it can't be 100% accurate, I wouldn't think. Um, and those type of things certainly happen. Um, it, and you know, it frustrates. We've had, we've had in the past and current clients that, that see similar things. And it's like, man, I see this site that has, you know, it, it's repurposed like 10 times with duplicate material on five different domains. And, and you know, the key is education and understanding what is happening and then reconciling that with, with where our client's brand and organization business strategy is going to be. Um, you know, and, and, and going in it about it that way. Um, because, you know, if you're in it for, for the long haul and you, you can't do things like that because once Google does catch it and penalize you, it's, it's going to ruin your business. And certainly in the last year, we've seen companies lose their business because of things they have done. And it's a shame, really. Um, it's a shame because sometimes these business owners, they just they didn't even know what the, what the practices were. So education is critical here, understanding what your competitors are doing, like you're doing now with, with Moz and everything. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, all right, one more question, and then we'll be done. Um, if someone's looking for, because the, the biggest question is, where do you start? So if someone's saying, look, I don't really have a grand content strategy right now. Maybe they're just mm -hmm. starting this process. What, what's the best place to start? Is it is it a benchmarking tool to say, okay, here's where I am now. Here's where I want to be. Is there a tactic? What, what's the, the first thing someone should do if they're trying to start down this content marketing path? Yeah, I think there's a combination of things to do. Well, one step is to look at your competitors, um, both your traditional competitors and competitors for the keywords you want to to do well for. Um, throwing out things like you know Wikipedia or something, things that you know you might just not be in in the right. You're not playing in the same um, arena for. Um, but looking at what their volumes are and and what they're doing, if they're if they're blogging. How often do they blog? Is it daily? Is it weekly? Um, something of that nature. Um, if they're creating white papers, how often do they publish them? And what are they using to distribute them? Um, it, it's really doing a, an audit uh, of how your competitors stack up against your current initiatives. Um, you know, for me, I don't, you know, it's just it's a simple matrix in Excel of, you know, competitors A through whatever. Um, and here's what they're doing, and here's how often they're doing it, and here's what I'm going to need to do to to play, um, you know, in this particular space. Um, so that that's one place to start. Um, and I tend to think that you know, if you're thinking purely what content tactic should I look at first, uh, I really think that the blogging um, is a nice, easy way to get into the habit of producing content, just because of it's conversational nature, um, and, and most software, such as WordPress or you know similar applications, are going to be um, uh, fairly uh, good at enabling uh, both SEO strategy and social media strategy. Perfect. That's great. Well, Derek, thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for uh, showing up today. We appreciate that as well. Uh, this uh, webinar recording will be emailed to you tomorrow morning, bright and early. Uh, so hopefully when you get into work, you'll have it in your inbox. Um, and then we'll also, um, we'll also make sure to, in that email, include uh, a link to our webinar library so you can go and view other webinars as well. So thank you for attending, everybody, today. Derek, any final thoughts before we conclude, sir? Um, well, just just thank you again. Uh, thanks everyone for their time this afternoon and, and joining in. And, and I hope that uh, you found it of value. And, and feel free to reach out to me, um, yeah, through Twitter or or yeah, if any questions come up or, or anything of that nature. Really appreciate awesome. the time. Awesome. No, Derek, we appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for your time, sir. And everybody, thanks again for attending. And uh, hope to see you next week. Bye bye.